Right, um, let me get started. Sorry, um, there was a technical problem today to stream this lecture, so it's just recorded. Um, what I would like today, as you can see, is I want to switch gears a little bit, and that is I would like to go to some more practical things which will be necessary for your project in the next few weeks. We have, what is it now, almost the end of March, so we have about five weeks or six weeks left at best. And we will try to allocate a fair amount of time towards doing the project and preparing the project so that you actually know what you're doing and you can implement it on the now and you can try it. Um, first of all, we need some control tools in place and some simulation tools. The interface which you now have is kind of nice, but it's not necessarily sophisticated enough to do interesting control. But, well, you can get into it, but it's fairly complicated and not what you would normally have. Well, it, it's more meant, let's put it this way, it's more meant to be used by kind of very simple users which don't have a lot of knowledge about control and don't want to interface with a low level of the robots, which we usually would like to do. So what I'm going to do today is essentially going through a tool which we've been working with over the last 20 years. This tool is called SL for Simulation Lab. Um, it's nothing but a piece of software which allows you to create physical simulations of robots, test out your control systems, and to use the same software to actually connect to a physical robot and then run this as a real-time control system with pretty much the same software as before. So I will just try to tell you a little bit about the history, where this comes from, what were the ideas of that, and then about what's inside of the system, how it connects to real-time, some example applications, a um, little bit what we think is good or bad about our tool at the moment. There is no standard tool out there, unfortunately, so these things are always developing. And I will show you some examples how to use it, and that's really what I need, since I, you will, in the next homework assignment, definitely get something which will use this tool. So you need to be a little bit prepared. It's also good if this is recorded. You can revisit this lecture and see what's going on. So let's get going. Okay, once upon a time. Um, so this were control systems which we used to use in the mid-90s, roughly. Um, this is a, what is called a VME bus, so it's just a cage. You can put slices of computers in there, and they communicate via the bus of the backplane. It's a fairly slow bus, just 20 megahertz. Nothing to write home about in, in modern days. Um, but it was in the 90s a beautiful way how to create a multiprocessor environment. Remember, you didn't have multi cores at that moment, you hardly had multi processors. So each of those slices here is simply a single computer. These are all some kind of power, CP, power PC computers. And so we basically created many of them, and they had a special operating system which is called VXWorks um, to run software on all of those things that they can communicate with each other, they can share memory with each other, they can uh, truncate each other, send signals or call semaphores to each other. So yet in the process of communication in a very nice and, and consistent way. So we created this roughly at the early 90s at MIT together with a colleague and friend of mine, Chris Atkinson, who was a professor at MIT at the time, is now a professor at CMU actually. Um, so modern days don't look like this anymore. So we got rid of this. But what was really cool about these tools in the old days is besides that you could just add another processor as you needed. So you just extended this, this architecture. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven processors. Um, you could also get a lot of third party board how to interface devices. And one of the miseries of, of life is often how do you interface to an IMU? How do you interface to some CAN bus? How do you interface to some real-time um, internet communication protocol? How do you create a real-time USB? When it comes to real-time, all these things become much harder. When it comes to normal processing on a standard computer where you don't care about real-time, it makes no difference. And just important, what, what is the key component about real-time computing? The real-time computing allows me to guarantee that I will never see a latency in my processing more than blah. And blah is usually really, really small, like in the microsecond range. While on a normal Unix computer, you can you have perfect real-time computer for five minutes, and then you may get suddenly like half a second delay spikes or something like that because the operating system is doing something crazy. 
Now, in a robot, it will kill you. You will fall over, you will hit something, you will kill the robot, you will kill the environment. It's not good. Um, so, VxWorks had all these extension boards to pretty much anything you wanted, any peripheral device. And these days, we also have parallel ports, in particular, a lot of serial ports were very popular, analog to digital converter, digital to analog converters, depending on what you need. Um, we replicated all these things these days on, on, on real-time operating systems which run on a standard Unix platform. It was actually very painful. It took, took quite a while to do a bit of work. So, importantly, um, VxWorks is really a professional real-time operating system. You can buy it. It costs you twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, depending on, on, on how much money you, what, what kind of a version you want to, to buy. It's used a lot in industrial applications. I think VxWorks was uh, on the rovers, which was flying to Mars. So NASA and JPL using VxWorks a lot. It's used in networking applications where real-time computing also matters a lot. It's just expensive. So and it's, so for universities, partially almost not affordable. It's so expensive it is. And also, you need to always work with very specialized software. You need to find other boards, periphery boards, which can work with a specialized software. So in kind of modern days, it's annoying. Um, what does VxWorks usually do? So it, it usually offers you a development environment where you sit just on a normal host computer. The old days it was a Solaris, some Solaris computer. These days it would be a normal Unix machine. From there, you can connect to these little computers, which were in the VME bus from the previous slide. And you can communicate with them. Uh, it downloads a special real-time operating system to each of those little computers. These little computers have as little additional processing as needed. So that the host computer is the big interface and it's not real-time. The little computers do all the real-time processing and they don't run any kind of fancy additional functionality. <laughs> okay, now I do not need you guys to connect you. Could you just disconnect? Thank you. Sorry. Um, what was nice about this work that it has that seamless integration between what you do on the host and that it automatically gets pushed to the little real-time computers as necessary. I already mentioned it has multiple targets, which is great. So you could do multi-processing. Um, I mentioned communication, memory sharing. Everything works through normal TCP IP networks. Guaranteed real-time performance. This is really important. This which is fabulous. You can create a five kilohertz clock and things will happen just right when you need it. That's really the, the, the power of real-time computing. If you say something with highest priority, happen now, it will happen now. It will not be buffered, it will not be delayed, it will happen now. And that was really cool. Um, and it basically just interacted with normal file sharing on the, on, 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 in, in Unix operating system. So what a typical VxWorks environment used to look like in our world, so this is what we used until about four or five years ago, was essentially there's a host computer running kind of the host interface of VxWorks. It communicates through the VME bus to a whole bunch of target computers, as they're called, so processors. And those then have input output to a robot. In our case, it was a robot which had an additional interface which was doing a lot of digital to analog conversion. So for every degree of freedom of the robot, there was what is called an advanced joint controller. And that was actually controlling, um, with the help of VxWorks, every degree of freedom in terms of reading signals, sending commands, doing all kinds of signal filtering and things like that. All right. So this was kind of the old days. And what a very useful way of working with things. One component which we really like was if you have separate computers running certain processes, you just put some of the processes you really care about, like those which do motor control and safety so the robot cannot fall over, do something terrible. You program this in a very lean way on one of those processors. And even if all the other ones core dump or do something terrible, um, the main processor will stay alive and keep the robot safe. So this was kind of a nice thing. In, in modern days, you know, you, you do core dump in the entire Programming gone, and then everything will potentially go bad. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit what the idea of SL is on top of that. So, SL was nothing by the way to create a general software package which 
when it's run in a simulation mode, it basically mimics the architecture of VX works in having multiple processes or processors, but processes do the same thing. And it has a graphics interface, and instead of the real robot, it was communicating to a physical simulation. And when you want to use it on a real robot, it would basically just interact with VxWorks in the normal type way and basically replace in an invisible way all the communication to the individual processors and replace the simulation with a real robot. But otherwise, the software looks, on the end user's point of view, exactly the same. Um, when we created SL, it had a couple of very simple design criteria, which may be different from what many people do in, in normal software engineering. So we really care about something which is super fast. Many times you want to explore on a simulator how a robot works, how a control system works, how an algorithm works, and you don't want to waste a lot of time. Ideally, this runs super real time as much as possible. Many of our simulations are 10 to 100 times real time. So this is very lean code, so nothing fancy, nothing complicated. Really, really fast, simple computing, very good algorithms, not a lot of overhead for, for anything else. Not a lot of overhead for fancy interfaces, actually. Um, we created a physics simulation component, which basically used what you already know about rigid body dynamics, so about inverse dynamics, forward dynamics, kinematics, homogeneous transformation, matrices, all kinds of coordinate transformations, so you get information about every part of the robot where you want, working with quaternions, quaternion controllers, PD and PID controllers. So basically, most of the interesting functions which we need on a robot are basically already available in SL, and they are automatically generated for every robot which you implement. We did care about multiprocessing, multi-threading. So multiprocessing, again, keep the processes which should never die isolated from those which may get bugs, and that is very helpful. Multi-threading is obvious that you have whatever, for computational purposes, uh, multiple threads to, to do faster computing. We added a fair amount of visualization tools. Um, you saw a little bit in the Roth lecture how really cool visualization tools look like. However, it's much simpler, and um, it actually connects to Roth if you want to. Um, very important, it's very easy to configure for different robots. So it takes you usually half a day or a day, and you have, have a basically a new simulator for a complete different robot, which is nice. Um, the end user is kept away from the complexity of programming. You get, and that's what you will see actually in your, in, in your homework, in your project. You will be connected just to the end user interface, and you don't have to worry about all the details in the background. Um, you will get a fairly simple programming environment to accomplish what you like. Um, it all runs on standard Unix systems, whether it's a Mac or whether Ubuntu or any other brand of Unix. And it also runs on real-time Unix systems. We used to have it running on VxWorks, and we switched over to the real-time uh, operating system, Xenomai, which is an open-source system, which is very, very good. It takes a moment to get used to it, but then it's really nice to work with. And so SL seamlessly integrates with that. I'll tell a little bit more about this. SL has very little dependencies on external software packages. You don't have to pull 150 packages before you can use it. It actually depends on four or five. Super simple. And it can interface to anything you want, so you have a very special, a separate process if you want to work with well. So let me show you some examples. So here are robots which we've been working with in the recent past. So this is a two-arm robot that we have in our lab for manipulation. Um, actually, this is a robot which is in, in, in a European lab. This is what we have at UHC. This is our humanoid which we have in the lab. And this was a little robot dog which was walking over rough terrain. It's all the same simulation environment. The interface looks exactly the same. The robot in the background is different. And that's essentially it. Let me just pull up some of those points here. Um, some, some key elements. In SL, so it was, as I mentioned, originally developed for multiprocessor real time control using VxWorks. Then we added in the mid 90s kind of uh, physical simulation engines. And since 2008, we went over to the open source system Senomai, which is also a hard real time operating system on Ubuntu platforms. It's actually a kernel, a second kernel which you install on top of your normal Ubuntu kernel. And then it basically takes over in this kernel all the real time operating. 
and it's used by a whole bunch of people, um, colleagues, ex-students, and, and friends. Now, let's go a little bit more into detail what's going on inside. And uh, the key component is to separate the processing of a robot into some core processes. One of them is essentially what we call a motor servo. These are silly names that were given to the system a long, long time ago, kind of developed over time. The motor servo is essentially just something which creates a feedback controller and a feedforward controller. And then basically sends a motor command to the robot or to the physical simulation, gets state feedback from that system, um, filters it, processes it, and then basically it gives all of that to a higher level process, which we call the task server, where you basically implement your task. This is the interface which you will see most of the time. What you do here is essentially the trajectory planning, design behaviors, you create control policies, you do splines or whatever you want, you compute a feedforward command with inverse dynamics, for instance, and then you send basically the feedforward command and the desired position and velocity command to the motor server that's communicated through shared memory, and it will basically realize the complete control that's in it to the robot send it back. And um, what is nice if something happens here because your task uh, server, your, your planning algorithm has some problems, if you cut by mistake the connection here, then this motor server keeps the robot alive and shuts it down nicely in a, in a control system. We also have basically the ability to add additional processes to that. One of them is for instance, we call the vision server. This is when you want to add cameras and get some visual input in real time, particularly. And so we used to use actually color block trackers in a long time ago. These days you could have put this a connect sensor here, which then basically does some basic processing to see objects in the world and communicate the positions and orientations of these objects to the task server that it can plan. It would actually be useful these days to have one more box here, which would be for the ROS interface, and that basically creates all the communication to ROS messages. Very important, ROS is not real time. So you need to have a safe communication uh, structure which can communicate messages in and out without breaking the real time of, of the other processes. And that is guaranteed the way it's being generated. So when you look at they say when you start this L for a particular robot, this is for a humanoid robot, you get a whole bunch of windows, something you can configure actually as you wish. But you usually see a graphics and a simulation. You get something which in real time shows you some data traces of great interest, for instance, positions, velocities of all the joints, some command. This is actually useful. You will notice this when you work with that. So just get a feel for what's happening. If you suddenly see a signal which is very noisy and behaves very strangely, something is wrong. So then you get immediately feel that you may be shutting down. Or you want to just monitor a particular signal which is very important over time, all the time. This is helpful. For instance, you see here, there's some spikes here. So you might want to worry what these spikes are and you might want to look into that. Oops, so computer goes a little bit back and forth. On the right side, you see the, diff the, the windows to the different processes. So this here is what we call the task servo. This here would be the vision servo. This is the motor servo. Here's a window which is communicating to the simulator, the physical simulator, and here's another process which is creating the OpenGL graphics visualization. Important, this process here, OpenGL, is obviously not real time. The other ones are real time. Let me quickly try to fix that flickering. Okay, hopefully there is works again. Okay, hopefully the flickering is gone now. Um, okay, so that's the generic appearance. So let me show you a few more components of this software. So as I mentioned, we have multi-processing, multi-threading, and shared memory communication. Shared memory communication is really the nicest and fastest uh, way of communicating between 
multiple processes and it's really great, works very reliably. And as I mentioned before, this actually mimics this multiprocessor uh, architecture which we used to have in the Xworks, which now maps beautifully on, on multiple cores on a single computer, so we don't actually need multiple computers anymore, we just get many, many cores. In Xenomai, the real-time system, as you can say, which process runs on which core, and you get the equivalent of a multi-processor system, just when you get very nice shared memory communication, which is super fast. Um, let me see, what else? Let me get these other points up right away. What we implemented, I mentioned it before, a uh, lot of rigid body dynamics algorithms, in particular what is called Featherstone algorithms, which is a special version of rigid body dynamics in an extremely efficient algorithmic implementation. So it's pretty much considered the fastest algorithms which you can do to compute forward in, 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 in inverse dynamics, kinematic functions, and, and all of these. So there's kind of weird names. So there's Newton Euler inverse dynamics. You know that. that but Featherstone also, he was a really smart theoretical roboticist. He created some more efficient algorithms, which is called the composite inertia inverse dynamics, articulated body forward dynamics. Um, these are all algorithms which are linear in the runtime with respect to the degrees of freedom of the robot, which is really nice. So you can have a big humanoid and just get a linear time penalty, which is kind of neat. Um, basically, in order to create these, all these mass things, you have to create a little kinematic description of the robot, usually by just essentially coding something in terms of homogeneous transformation matrix is how you get from one degree of freedom to the next one, very much what um, the dynamic Heisenberg convention is actually prescribing. And this is automatically then processed by some Mathematica programs which we wrote a long time ago, and it creates C programs. So these C programs are compiled into the software and then do everything you want. This is essentially creating this configuration file is a little bit painful that can take two or three hours. The rest happens within basically seconds or minutes. Um, we also basically have a fair amount of work in, in simulating contacts. Contacts are really painful to simulate since there's many different algorithms. Some of them are excessively fast, as slow, some of them are not very good. And yeah, it's, there's no real agreement what is the right way of doing contacts and a robot is contact in the world. So you see this here on the on this picture, you see all these little red balls on these kind of turquoise arrows that basically show that there are some contact forces acting on the feet and all these uh, points which are turned on are contact points at this moment. The way we basically simulate is simply we create little spring damper systems at, at each of these points and then basically compute the force which is generated by pushing into the floor. And that works reasonably well. It requires some tuning, unfortunately, which is not the most favorable thing to do. Okay, so let me go to the next point. And this is kind of how this is structured in SL programming. There's essentially, as you can see in this box here on the right, there's three components. There's basically the core libraries of SL, which are completely generic. They apply to any robot. Then there's basically for a particular robot, some robot-specific extensions, which basically model this particular robot. And then users can add or compile into the code their little pieces of code, which realize a certain task. Um, that's essentially it. You will only see this part. If you create a robot, you will see that. And if you really want to change how it's working, you will have to interface with that. Um, everything is programmed in C or C++, mostly actually in C, since it's pretty old that we programmed that. It's, it's moving slowly over to C++ components. I mentioned before there's a ROS interface, which was actually created by Peter Pasta and Manuel Kalakrishnan, who are now at Google Robotics. These are fabulous people. Um, Interestingly, as a user, you can, if you know how to do this, you can override a fair amount of things which are happening on the low level. So if, if you're a good user, you can actually use your user environment and kind of get rid of a fair amount of the automatic uh, functionality of SL, which for some advanced users is really useful. We have simple, clean C libraries for SL. Um, we have high, as I mentioned before, hardly dependent dependencies on external packages. 
And one simple thing is actually Adela has been compiling for the last 15 years on any Unix platform we wanted to. It has never been a problem. It does not run on Windows, unfortunately. It's just too different. So we don't want to put any work into that. Documentation is always in these kind of things which are done at universities a little bit weak. And there is actually under this link and also on the web page of the course of this lecture is a link to a manual which describes SL from about five, six, seven years back. It's still 90% correct, except that some of the details in the background have changed. I will tell you a little bit more about how it works on the task server that you implement the task which is essentially by creating some specialized functions which get automatically called, basically something which initializes your task, something which runs your task, and also something where you can do online parameter changes. This is something I will explain to you in a later slide in more detail, since this is actually the interface which will be important for you to work with. Okay, so here's some examples of what you can do with this L just for fun. And so this is actually a humanoid robot trying to climb into a, yeah, kind of, it's called a Polaris Ranger, it's some kind of, not a golf cart, it's a little bit of an off-terrain cart, which people use in, in, in kind of rural environments or sometimes also in golf courses. Now, I guess this is not coming across so nicely through the video recording, but you get the idea. So these are three different views of the same task that the robot has to hold on to the bars of the cart. It's basically, its rear end into, into the car on the seat. It's not easy. There's actually very little space to get inside there. And in the end, it will sit down, hold on to the steering wheel, and basically hit with the right foot the pedal, the gas pedal. As a peculiar thing, the robot actually doesn't fit behind the steering wheel, so it sits down on the passenger seat and just uses the left hand for steering which is totally fine and actually excuses the left foot, I guess, in the end, in order to do the gas. All right, off it goes. Point. Good. So this is actually, it's a fairly complicated task to realize in a simulator with all these contact forces and, and actually also computing the full body motion of the robot is not trivial. It took us about a week to get this going on, given that the simulator was already there. You can look at this as kind of fun. Also, in a different animation now, basically you don't see the, the cart, you just see uh, the robot stepping in the cart, but the cart is just uh, deleted from the, from the graphics. And it looks kind of cool what you, what you can see, how it's grasping and how it's basically moving its limbs. Before this was mostly occluded by the cart, so you couldn't see so much of the details. So some things which might be interesting, this, this uh, yellow ball here is the center of mass of the robot. The um, red ball is what is called the center of pressure. This is basically the centroid of all the forces on, at the feet. I wouldn't call this entirely elegant, um, but it's surprising. So this is a real robot, it's our humanoid robot which we have in the lab. And it's surprisingly hard for a robot to get in there. So one of the big missing components of robots is flexible spines, and they make our lives much, much easier. All right, pushing its leg down. I think it will just move its pelvis over on the seat. You need pretty strong hands for that, actually. If you have weak hands, this is not going to work. And you see, well, these, these force arrows, they're just scaled arbitrarily so to see small forces. But you can see, essentially, from the magnitude of the force arrows that the robot is holding on strongly. All right, now it should be sitting down. Or it's already, okay, it seems already sat down, it has already hit the gas. Okay, anyway. So let me just pop up the next component. Um, as I mentioned, we actually switched recently to Xenomai over to a, a few years ago. Some um, information on, on, on Xenomai. 
So Tenomite is what is called a dual kernel approach, where the new kernel that gets installed is the primary kernel, it's the real-time kernel, and you have to basically use some special commands for certain system calls such that you stay in the primary kernel all the time. The primary kernel gives um, computation time to the standard Ubuntu kernel whenever it's needed. But the moment you switch into the Ubuntu kernel, you cannot guarantee real-time performance anymore since you never know when they come back. So it's a little bit of a program and discipline. It's not too hard, um, but if you do it right, you stay in the primary kernel with your real-time processing and real-time processing is guaranteed from then onwards. Um, what is important is actually Tenomai has by now nice components for CAN bus interfaces, which is a very popular robotics communication interface. There's a real-time communication internet for Ethernet, which is very important. Ethernet is very popular. Ethernet is standard, Ethernet not real-time, but there's a way how to make it real-time. Uh, there's also the first USB interfaces, which are real time, also not so trivial to realize. And then there's a whole suite of uh, software tools, how to communicate with data acquisition tools. These are actually boards, for instance, produced by National Instruments, which can read whatever analog signals convert them to digital. They have parallel port communication, they have clocks, they have triggers. Um, they have analog outputs, analog inputs, all kinds of things which are used in data communication and data acquisition tools. And that works incredibly well in real time. So we, I, I, a couple of years ago, we were still working with the developer to make it better, but by now he's kind of totally figured it out and it works really well. Actually, this, this tool is called Analogy, and some of you may know they on normal Unix platforms is a software tool which is called Comedy. And comedy is essentially the Unix version of data acquisition, but non real time. Analogy is the same, it's the analogy of comedy, except it works real time. And the interface to ROS actually works very nicely as well. One thing which can become tricky sometimes when you just buy a computer and then you install Ubuntu, then you install Tenomai and whatever tools you need. And then you go and try that everything works, sometimes things don't work. So there are things like IRQs which have to be matched. Sometimes some chips are not capable of realizing some of the real time performance for, for Ethernet. So you need to actually look at the recommendations of the Tenomai guys and if you use the right hardware or potentially buy different peripheral boards like Ethernet boards or USB boards which can realize the real time performance. So it takes a little bit of tinkering. The moment you have a nice stable system, don't touch it, work with it forever after. Okay, what is here? The so what is nice in our environment then is basically with using Xenomai, which never loses the standard Unix programming environment. So everything remains the same as the normal Unix environment. Except you avoid, when you do real time, you avoid things like print apps, disk accesses, some memory allocations are bad, um, you need to create special real time threads and things like that. So these are kind of the rules which you have to follow in order to make it work. But that is something you can learn. It's, it's, it's just a little bit of discipline. The manual of Xenomai, actually, the online manuals are really nice. So some fun things. So what we have created in the past, let me just turn the sound off. And these are just a bunch of movies of, of, of uh, robots which we've been working with in the past in which use uh, Xenomai on an Ubuntu platform with SL for real-time control. So this is a little robot dog which actually learned how to walk over fairly rough terrain. Down there is our manipulation robot. Here's our humanoid robot, just the lower half, just the leg with an experiment about balancing. And it was great, so we have absolutely no problems. It's very reliable, we're very happy with it. Okay, let me let this run for a little moment longer and then move on.
All right, so let me just keep on going. So just for a little bit for your information, what we are doing, so we're very happy with this SL tool because it's very simple, lightweight. People learn with, work with it and also learn how to change it fairly fast. Um, this kind of exact sharing of software between real-time control and the simulator is fabulous. And it's very quick to basically create a new robot. It's really not too much time. Well, given that this has been started to be programmed almost 20 years ago, there's a lot in standard and older C programming structures which could be updated to more modern uh, programming. I think if you do a little bit of templated code and a little bit nice class classes, you could reduce the footprint of the software by um, almost 50 to, to even 70 percent. I don't know. It needs to be nice and documented with a pain. And the physical contact simulations which you're using with our spring systems is still not really what you want. There's, there's mathematical tools which you could use to do this better, but we don't fully understand them yet, particularly not how to run them in a, in a decent speed. So this is, has to happen. Um, for the future, there's some, so this mathematical code which we're having is, is, is beautiful, um, but if you could realize something with Eigen, so one of the very famous C++ um, numeric libraries, you may actually get things faster and completely avoid that you need another tool like Mathematica, um, um, better contact dynamics, maybe nicer user interfaces, and maybe newer versions of real-time uh, operating systems. There's something which is coming out which is called the RT patch system, where you don't have a secondary kernel, but just a patch to the standard Linux kernel, which makes it uh, very, very good real-time. This is still in the works. The people don't entirely agree whether this works yet or not, but it may happen soon and that would make it even easier to work with real-time operating systems. Now, the next thing I want to do is actually I want to tell you a little bit about data visualization. So this was this L. I'll tell you a little more details about this L now, but also really important features of this L which you need in daily life. So, here is a nice picture of the nano robot. So first of all, you get a graphics uh, simulator or visualization of your robot where you can see what's going on. I mentioned before you have these kind of real time data traces where you can watch signals in real time. Here actually the robot is just moving its knee up and down and this is kind of the knee joint which you can see as a sinusoidal position trajectory and here the sinusoidal velocity trajectory. Um, what you see here is essentially the, it's just a debugging tool. You can actually watch how fast every component of your, of your code takes in the processing on each of your processes. So this is a very low level debugging tool. When you start to run really computationally expensive components, you need to know how long they take. So for instance, this robot runs at 100 hertz, which is fairly slow, but now it's just a very slow communication system. Uh, but that means you only have 10 milliseconds for computing. And then basically the next cycle starts. So you gotta make sure that you never compute more than 10 milliseconds, which in the end means you need to also have tools which can check how much do you compute. And we basically have how ways how we send basically uh, little signals which, which say, okay, which, which visualize how much one particular function is actually computing and we can visualize this in real time and see whether something is not working properly. So these real-time traces are very useful to see what's going on in your robot. They always, as you will see later on, they just move up all the time. So you cannot study them since they're gone after a few seconds really fast. But they give you an overall impression of what's going on with your robot, which is helpful. On the right side are just the regular terminals. Again, task servo, water servo. Here's the simulation. Here's the OpenGL component. Now, one component for data visualization which we're using is actually a particular outlet to MATLAB to visualize data traces over time. And I just wanted to show you that, and it turns out looking at data traces is one of the most important components when you work with robots and when you debug robots. And I think you should experience once what this looks like and how it feels, and also what you see in these data traces. So we have a tool which is called CMC, CMC, 
CLMC plot, which works in MATLAB as a data visualization tool. It essentially, all what it interfaces to is on the task server, you can, in, in our NSL, you just can collect certain variables in an inter-memory. It's not a big deal. So basically, you run it, say, 100 hertz, then every tick of your um, loop, which is running on the task server, you copy all those values, which you can predetermine through a little script file, and you copy them into memory. You say you want to collect data for 10 seconds, then the memory is basically full, and then you dump that as a file to disk. So the way this is actually uh, handled is through a command line command, which is called out menu, as shown here in this window. You get a very simple ASCII menu, how you can change the sampling rate for how often you want to uh, stick data into memory, from which file you read which variables you want to actually collect, and also for how long you want to collect. And this is something you might want to use, and you will get used to, and you can actually see what your algorithms are doing, since otherwise you have no idea what's going on. Just looking at the graphic simulators or this kind of oscilloscope traces, um, that doesn't tell you too much. So, let me show you to get basically into that for a moment. You need for a moment to know what the directory structure is in SL. It's on that particular for the user component and your user programmer. So you will have something which is called now user. That's the directory, the root directory of your code. In there is a make file, not surprisingly, there is some directory for source code, there's a directory for some preference files, directory for configuration files, and then there's all kinds of directories which have compiled objects for different um, operating systems, for instance, for Mac or for standard Unix system, or if you use standard Unix systems with Xenomite, uh, it will have a directory which looks like that. Those ones you don't care since they're automatically generated. Config you don't care right now since these are kind of important configuration parameters which you do want to change at this moment. In the press directory, you find actually a couple of scripts that, for instance, allow you to do data collection. So there's something like for the task server there is a underscore default dot script, which basically specifies all the variables which are normally collected. There's also something which is called the sample dot script, which actually specifies all the variables which you could collect. Essentially, the way this works is, it's somewhere in the programming, you have to basically give variables which you would like to collect to a collection facility by giving them a name, and you have to pass the pointer to this variable and that's good enough, and then basically the data collection can work. There's also the same kind of variables exist for the oscilloscopes which you want to visualize in the oscilloscope. There's things which can basically generate sinusoidal behaviors that you will see at some point how a robot can just move like that. You can just basically every degree of freedom should move with a sinusoidal movement of a certain frequency with a certain offset and with a certain amplitude, which is very straightforward. And there's also ways how you basically can specify the default data collection. You will get used to that. You don't need a lot of that. I just wanted to show you how this all works like. Now you will just have one quick peek into the task default script, which is a data collection script. So that looks essentially like here. There's just a whole bunch of names. These names when this script is read, will be automatically parsed, matched against what the software knows, what data collection it can do, and then it will, they will be collected. So here you basically have the right shoulder flexion extension, uh, underscore theta is the joint angle, theta dot is the joint velocity, theta dot dot joint acceleration, the motor command, feedback command, if there's a load sensor, the descent load at the degree of freedom desired, and also feed forward commands, for instance. There's many, many, many more. There's like thousands of variables you can collect, but this is just a typical stack subject. This is for the shoulder flexion extension. This is the degree of freedom which would be going like this. And shoulder eduction abduction is the degree of freedom which goes in and out like this. Humoral rotation is a rotation about the humerus, which is the upper bone of your upper arm. And there's many more. Um, just to show you how you collect data after you basically have a particular data collection strip read in, and um, you simply SCD for start collect data, then it will basically for, in this case, for five seconds collect the data and tell you that it, the, the buffer is full, and then you type save data and it will be dumped into a file. 
And if you look in your just Unix um, directory, just in a normal terminal window, you see that there's a file E0004, which is being generated. These files are automatically number, uh, named. They always start with a D, and the numbers just keep on increasing. And if you manage to basically create something like 99,999 data files, you've done a very good job debugging over time. Okay, so this is, I think, straightforward. Um, the next thing is then basically you have now this file sitting in your home directory of the robot in now user. Now you go to the same directory in MATLAB, which is here. You see the same kind of uh, subdirectories here. You see the D000 file. And as you can see down there, you just type CLMC plot. And obviously, you need to get the software CLMC plot, which will be provided to you. It's not a big deal. And obviously, this pops up a graphics interface, which looks like this. It's essentially very, very straightforward and simple. It is just a whole bunch of uh, windows, which have a main window, which displays the entire trajectory of a data trace, and then a zoom window, where you can see basically a magnified version of it. You see all the variables of your data file. You can't read them, obviously, but you can see them here with all the numerical values every data point has. And there's a little bit of a red line which shows you at which point you're currently visualizing the data. Right now, it's at zero. It's pretty boring. And then there's a whole bunch of button, buttons which are easy to understand um, just by looking at them. Um, if you look at our manual, which is online on the course syllabus, the SL manual, actually CLMC plot is fairly well described. There's only a few additions which have been added in the past, which are not very profound for you to, to know about. Okay, so now the file is read in. And now if I want to visualize some data traces, I basically click on a variable here and then click on the window where I want to see it and then get visualized. So what you see here is actually, again, you, this is just, unfortunately, you cannot see this with the resolution appropriately, but you see basically a position trajectory of the right knee flexion extension and its desired trajectory. Now they overlap perfectly, which means things are working nicely. And you can see here the velocity trace with the desired velocity, here the acceleration trace with the desired acceleration, and here you see all the commands, like the commands you send, so the U command, the total command you send out, and the feedback component of it, and the feed forward component. The idea is that feedback and feed forward added together should be the total command. So these are typical visualizations. You can see that here in the zoom window, this is basically on a basically zoomed time scale to see a little bit more. Again, the idea is very simple. You click on a variable, you click where it's supposed to go, and you will see it. You can put multiple variables in the same window if you want to superimpose them. And you have ways how to delete them, the last one or the entire plot. You can add more plots if you like to. You can have fewer plots. So it's very customizable. And then you can also save views. There's something which is called views, save views, or, or um, what is this, create view. Okay. Low resolution. Um, and you can basically save particular views. So if you have a bunch of variables and you want to see the view of all joint angles, you click on that view. If you want to see the wall view of all joint velocities, you click on that. This is just to basically quickly flip through different views so you can debug things very, very rapidly. Okay, so this is data visualization. And again, I will ask you in a homework, most likely, to use this tool after you program something and to visualize what you've been doing and then tell me what you think about it. It's not a hard tool to get work there to, to get used to it. It's literally just a few buttons you can click and that's it. Now I need to spend a little bit more time on the programming part of it now. The part which you're going to see is what is called the task server. This is where you're interfacing with your programs. And what the task for the server is doing is essentially at a particular sampling rate, for instance, 100 hertz for the now. That's not really high. Normally, we use 500 hertz or kilohertz. Um, we basically get data from the motor server. These are sensory variables mostly, and load variables or anything which could be collected from the robot. Um, we provide those 
variables through the shared memory to your local user interface. And then what you have to do, you have to generate desired trajectories and feed forward commands. And again, you have to do this as an now at 10 milliseconds or 100 hertz. And then basically the task server writes that back to the motor server. The motor server will create the complete PD control of the feed forward command. So it's very straightforward, not very complicated. You'll see a graph in a second again. Um, what you need in order to program a new task is you need an initialization function. I will tell you more about that, which is important. It runs in a non -time, not in real time thread. So initialization, you can have predators and you can have dialogues with the user where you have to type something, it's totally harmless. But then when you're done with the initialization, usually you have a question, are you ready to run? And when you're ready to run, you basically go and start something which is called a run function. This is now real time critical. You can only create code there, which, is, which, which can be executed in real time, it doesn't break things. And then there's a special function which allows you to online change parameters. This is more like tweaking things. Sometimes when you run a robot, you want to change games online slowly. And the easiest way is to have the robot running and you change those games. It's a little bit of a dangerous thing since you're interfering with variables which are currently used by a running controller. So often you have to be very cautious that you don't make a typo. And, and, and try 1,000 instead of 10 or something like that. So it's good to have you have if-then statements which check variables before they're actually used. I'll, I'll mention that again. Okay. Now, the task server loop. You had that plot before, just you couldn't read it. It was too small. Now it's bigger. So here's again what it does. This is the main loop. The main loop starts by reading from shared memory what the motor servo has basically read from the real robot. It does all kinds of miscellaneous computations, like it computes for you all kinds of homogeneous transformation matrices, the positions where every link is, the center of masses, and all kinds of things which are standard useful tools. And just then basically uh, it goes through your task. And your task compo is composed of three things, the initialization, the runtime, and the change routine. If there's no task, it basically goes through some kind of dummy task, which doesn't do anything. After it's done, it basically writes the current motor commands to shared memory that goes back to the motor server and starts all over. What you have to do if you create a user task, you create your own initialization, runtime, and change function, and when you're ready to use that, you will actually switch over to that. And then your runtime function goes into the real time loop. It gets inserted. So then you basically run here like this. And so that is the key part which you need to learn how to program. Let me quickly get my power supply, just a second. Not good. OK, so now let me look into these three functions a little bit in more detail. So adding a new task now means you write a C or C++ function that contains these uh, three required coutines. You will actually find a sample task C or sample task C++ in the directories which were provided for you with software. You write them, you compile them. And then there's in the interface of the task server, you can type set task. The short for that is ST. And it basically gives you a menu. You can select your task and you can run it. So that you will get used to. And I will also show that in some live demos to you one more time. Quick thing, what happens in the initialization function, usually what happens is that you want to make sure that nothing else is running. So the robot is not running a task. You want to take the robot into initial posture. For instance, let's say I want to bounce the ball and I stand like this. I want to get my hand up there so I can bounce the ball. Uh, I might want to initialize some variables, find some timing variables, some gains, whatever I care about. And then I trigger the task execution. It's really just a prologue. 
Now, in the run function, we have two things which are important. There's really what is called the variable, this is the structure joint desired state. That basically is what you have to fill out. It's actually shown here on the right side is the, the, the definition of the structure. Joint, joint desired stage has a desired joint angle, desired velocity, and a feed forward command. These are the three co points, uh, components you have to set up, uh, fill out. You can always set the feed forward command to zero if you don't know anything else. So this is what you have to generate. What you get from essentially through the motor servo is information in the structure joint state. That is kind of the most important component for you, which tells you the current joint angle, current joint velocity, current joint accelerations, the torque command, which was last sent out, and also the load, if there's a load sensor at every degree of freedom, which measures how much torque or force is generated there. So the definitions are here. And what you see here is essentially the enumeration of all the robot degrees of freedom. We start with one as an index um, for tradition. We don't have a zero robot degree of freedom. It's actually reserved for the base. The, if you have a robot which has a base that can move its base around like a humanoid robot. So these are all the degrees of freedom on the now robots. That's for the right side, for the left side. For the right side, the shoulder flexion extension, deduction, abduction, humor rotation, the elbow movement, the equilibrium wrist movement like this, and then can open and close its fingers. And there's similar degrees of freedom for the, for the leg. We get back to that. There's the head, which can be rotated like this and can do some nodding like this. And that's pretty much all that the now has. So these structures here have NDOS plus one. Uh, components and you can basically use those variables to index into them. Okay, so this is just basic setup about commands. Again, this manual you have online, it actually describes these variables as well. Quick thing, the change function. Um, the change function is just an online function to change uh, parameters. And it's really a tuning function. It's not used in, 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 in normal daily life. And very important, you've got to be careful what you're doing. If you're messing with a real-time running uh, control loop, so the right thing is if you type certain variables which you would like to change, read them into a temporary variable, check the temporary variable for some min-max value or reasonable values, and then copy the temporary variable in the variable which matters. Like if you have a position gain, first read it into a K temp, and then you have K temp check that it's positive, that it's not zero, that it's not greater than 10, for instance, then you copy K temp into K, which is your position gain. So just showing you a little bit of code, see whether we can see that. It should be at least visible, I hope. We use CMake for creating make files and for compiling. Um, CMake is a very standard tool these days. Most of you may know it. It's just basically something which creates make files from a more abstract and easy to work with description language. The file which you care about is in the source subdirectory, and the file we care about is CMake list list, which is shown here. And there's all kinds of stuff in there which you don't have to care about. Really, all that matters is there's one tiny little blog which basically specifies all the files you want to compile, like for instance, sample task.c or sample task underscore c plus plus dot c plus plus. So these are things. If you wanted to add more files in your task, you just add them here, and that's it. Everything else will be done automatically. You type make, and good stuff happens, and things get recompiled. Now, here's an example of the, of the sample task. Now, this is, I think, roughly readable for you. It has just some initial declarations. So this is the C version, not the C++ version. Um, you can declare variables at the top of the file of wherever you want to declare variables. This is up to you. There is something, a function which needs to be there, which is how to add the sample path to your code. Um, I didn't discuss that. It always looks the same thing. It basically has the init function, the run function, and the change function. The pointers to these functions are passed with the help of a special function with the edge task function, and the name is given to the task, and, and you're done. Okay. So this is just a header. 
here is the initialization component of a task. And if you read through this, you will um, you will also have these things in your C code if this is too hard to read on slides. I just wanted to show it to you, just at least how the codes look like. You will see that there are some initializations of variables, some static variables which tell you whether you did something for the first time or not. There's this component where you um, create a target and then you run the robot to go to this particular target and wait there. This kind of an initialization which gets you to a start posture. And then comes a bunch of questions whether are you really sure that you want to run this task? So you're done with initialization. And then the thing starts running and basically you keep track of some additional variables. If you read this code, I think it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's nothing profoundly complicated. Um, the run function is most important. What you're going to see here is actually in this task that the robot does a simple one degree of freedom movement with degree number one, which in our way would be the right shoulder flexion extension would be a movement like that. And this is actually useful. You see a typical way how you can um, create a sinusoidal desired trajectory by creating a position trace just from using the sine function, a velocity trace, and the acceleration trace. So you have to compute this at every moment of time. Then you basically assign these target values to the joint desired state structures. And when you're done with that, you compute the inverse dynamics with a specialized function, and you're done. Then automatically, in the variable joint desired states, you have desired position, velocity, and a feed forward command, which will be executed. So this is a great little example of what you do. And what you will most likely face in your third homework assignment is to change this example to create a, a point, point movement with splines uh, for the robot farms. And that gives you a fairly good feeling for what it takes to, to actually get something like this done. Last not least is the change function. So here, the change of the sample task. And you see there's just some functions. One, we have simple functions which basically read integer values or double values or whatsoever. They print out a comment. You basically give it a default value. And then with a pointer, you get back. Um, the variable which you want. These are just little routines. You can do this in many different ways. This is just a convenient routine we have for all kinds of quick reading of variables. And again, what is important is you read them, you basically allow the user to type something. When users type, they make mistakes. And so the right thing is actually to check for mistakes and not just to read it brutally in the variable of choice. And here's just some dummy variables which are local. If you wanted to use these variables in your control loop, you would assign them to a more important variable, and that should be done appropriately. All right, so this was essentially what I wanted to show you. Let me just start for one moment the now simulator so you see it actually in real running. And what do I have to do for that? Let me check. We have this screen. Let me just move that over here. Okay, X now. Okay, now it pops up windows all over the place. So this is what the Simulator looks like the, the graphics window is now from this in terms of screen resolution not working very well for me. Um, here you see let's let me just get the important window in. So this is your task servo. And now basically choose a task by doing ST for a set task. I choose the sign task. Um, I ask for some questions, use the default sign. I just use the defaults for everything. 
and I start the task. And what you should see is now that the robot is moving its legs up and down. We can also look. Let's see, it's got to get this window. We can look at the oscilloscope window. Now, this is most likely really hard to see in the recording here, but you can see how basically the data traces change over time. You see different degrees of freedoms, the position and the velocity traces, and you can change basically what you want to monitor here. Um, we can also see that the system is right now roughly running in real time. We have a real time mode also for the simulator. It runs roughly at 100 hertz. When you take, tell the Unix system, the Ubuntu normal system to run in real time, it's just approximate. It's not quite accurate. And you have just a normally working system. I don't show you the other processes right now. Um, just to go back to this, if you want to do data collection, this is essentially what you had in the slides before. Let me just get over here. I have to find my mouse pointer, sorry. Okay, here we go. For data collection, you just type start collect data. Then it starts data collection after about five seconds. That should be now. You see the buffer is full command. You can say save data and the data file is saved. If you spell it correctly, of course, only now it worked. Um, a very useful command in all these processes is actually the man for manual. So it shows you all the commands you can actually use. And that is obviously quite helpful if you just want to see what you can type in these windows and what is going to happen. All right. So that was it for today. Just to give you a outline of what matters for getting a real control system going on a simulator or on a physical robot. You will still see more of that. You will use this tool. You will get used to that. The functionality you use is very, very limited. It's not something complicated. It's not huge programming. It's just simple things. Um, but you will see what it takes to create something, to watch something on certain visualizations tools, and to debug it so that you can get a functional control system. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.